you all very much. Thank you very much. Uh, a few minutes ago, uh, we had the opportunity uh, of visiting Paris. And I'm not quite sure what the adjective is to use to describe uh, my feeling, but Jane was with me as well. And to say the least, um, it was sobering, it was shocking, it was sad. And I hope that what today is about, I made a promise to the folks a while back in Paradise that I would come here. I'm glad that we can honor that promise. But first of all, I want to thank our friends in the media for being here as well. And the purpose of being here today is to kind of learn a little bit more about what, what went on here. But most importantly, to make sure that, uh, and I'll be speaking about this in a moment after the panel is speak, is to make sure that the people of our country understand that President Trump is wrong, wrong, wrong when he believes that climate change is a hoax. It is no secret, I trust anybody here, or anybody in the country, that I disagree with Donald Trump on almost everything. <laughs> but, but, on this issue, on this issue, his ignorance is threatening not just the people of California, or Vermont, or America, but is threatening future generations on this planet. So we have, we have a global crisis. It's not just an American crisis. And what makes this crisis unique is if tomorrow the United States did all of the right things, and we just introduced a plan uh, yesterday, which I think does a lot of the right things, we could do it all. But unless the rest of the world comes in together with us, I fear very much about what kind of planet we're gonna be leaving our children and our grandchildren. So we have an enormous, enormous challenge in front of us. We have to take on uh, the fossil fuel industry. We have to, deal with countries around the world. And I'll speak to this in a minute. But at the end of the day, my dream is, and I don't know if it's, you know, it can happen or not, but we've got to give it a shot. And that is right now on this planet, uh, the countries of the world are spending about a trillion and a half dollars every single year on weapons of destruction designed to kill each other. Now, wouldn't it be extraordinary if we used that money to come together and instead of killing each other, Maybe we use that money against our common enemy to be trying to So we got, I mean, this is, you know, this is a huge deal. I mean, we are fighting for nothing less, in my view, than the future of the planet. The future of the planet. You know, the scientists call this an existential threat, and that's what they're talking about. So, uh, having said that, let me thank Audrey uh, Denny for her remarks. And we're going to hear now from some very great panelists, uh, and then I'll make some remarks and we'll open up to you for your questions and comments, and we'll do something with the media after all next time. Um, all right, let's welcome Mark Steeman. Mark is a professor uh, at CSU Chico, uh, who teaches course, courses in sustainability and civic engagement. Mark, come on up. The floods have already started. My name is Mark Steven, and I'm a professor of geography and planning at CSU Chico. Go Caps. I spent the last three years using the state's CalADAPT uh, tool to forecast the climate of Butte County and cities like Chico and Paradise. From that, I can tell you that the annual temperatures in Paradise have already two and a half degrees higher than the historical average. I can tell you that Paradise has already tripled the number of annual number of extreme heat days 
that his day is above 102 degrees. Historically, paradise average about four a year. Over the last 10 years, that average has risen to 12. It's looking to double in another decade. But the most important thing I can tell you is that climate change is not coming. Climate change is here. We already see this in the precipitation as the state cycles between extreme drought and extreme flooding. From 2014 to 2016, California suffered a crippling drought that led to water rationing. Then, at the end of 2017, the heavens opened and Butte County was hit with a dozen storms led with atmospheric rivers. And the resulting runoff threatened Oroville Dam and forced the evacuation of over 180,000 people. And then the rain stopped. It didn't rain again for 227 consecutive days. During the campfire briefings, fire experts claimed that this was the driest vegetation they had ever seen. We are experiencing a whipsaw of increasing extremes that is predicted to get even worse. I'll end with this story. I teach all of this in my senior seminar at Chico State, including last fall. We have class on Wednesday nights. Fire started Thursday morning. When we reconvened three weeks later, we realized that we had predicted wildfires and wildfires in our class. But the actual campfire was 10 times bigger than anything the models anticipated and it came 10 years sooner than anything CalAdapt had predicted. And that still freaks me out. We desperately need a Green New Deal. Washington with Chelsea West, who's a nurse uh, in Paradise. Uh, and what she told me was, what can I say? It's uh, something I haven't forgotten. Uh, please welcome uh, Chelsea West. Thank you. Chelsea West, and I'm a registered nurse from Chico, California. I worked at Feather River Hospital in the emergency department for seven years. I was working the morning of November 8th when the campfire was just getting started. By 8 a.m., our staff knew we had to act quickly to get our patients to safety. In under an hour, we evacuated 67 patients and about 500 staff members. When it was my turn to leave, I was faced with bumper to bumper traffic, pitch black skies, flames on all four sides of me. There was an extended period of time where I was fairly certain I would not be making it home to my family. By some kind of miracle, a bulldozer driver found me along with three fellow nurses and two members of law enforcement and was able to take us back to the hospital where we waited for the fire to burn enough that we could drive through the now desolate road filled with smoke and ash. Several weeks after the fire, a very unique opportunity presented itself and I found myself in Washington, D.C. attending a Bernie Sanders town hall on climate change. While several factors contributed to the catastrophic campfire, the role that climate change played is undeniable. When, when I sat down with Senator Sanders, I felt seen and heard. What I found was not just a well-qualified politician, but a man who genuinely cares about the well-being of others. I've been a longtime Bernie supporter, but I am now a walking example of his compassion for human beings and their experiences. We invited Senator Sanders to come to our town and he kept his word on showing up. He has come prepared with ideas on how we can fight climate change and prevent future disasters and further damage to our planet. This is not, this is not a one-man job. We need to come together. Every single one of us has a responsibility to take action, to educate ourselves on climate change, to learn what we can do as individuals and as a community. 
I would like to express my gratitude to Senator Sanders and to everyone who is here with the intention of making a positive change. It is because of this that I'm able to see some light after a very dark experience. So thank you. Navron uh, Mullick is a documentary filmmaker and co-founder of the Paradise Founded Storytelling Movement, ClimateUprising.org. Navron. So, I'm not from here. I'm from Los Angeles, and I'm a filmmaker. And I've gotten to make some videos that have gone viral, like Kane's Arcade and for the UN, leading up to the Paris Climate Agreement. I've gotten to see firsthand the power of the story and how it can spark the movement. I'm here because what happened in Paradise is part of a bigger story. It's connected to the climate change story that's going to threaten our collective survival. You know, the, this wildfire happened two days after a climate denier was re-elected to Congress. I know you guys tried. <laughs> At the same time the campfire was burning up here, the Woolsey fire was burning down where I'm from. My sister was one of 300,000 people who evacuated. Several, like three, lost their lives, and several of my friends lost their homes. Since these fires in November, we've had record flooding in Nebraska, devastating crops, deadly heat waves in Australia, in India, in Chennai, the city where I was born, 10 million people oh, that ran out of water. And the science is clear. This is caused by climate change, and it's an existential threat. That's why I was so angry when I saw that video of Trump visiting paradise, calling it pleasure. <laughs> Continuing to deny that climate change is real and telling us we just need to rake our forests. Well, I think it's time that climate deniers like Trump and Lamalfa get a raking in 2020. <laughs> Paradise and I saw that video. Some friends on Facebook and I were trying to crowdfund a campaign on Facebook and sent some campfire survivors and community organizers who are here today to go to Washington, D.C. in December to attend Bernie Sanders Town Hall on solving the climate crisis. These folks had just launched everything, but they went and they shared their stories with Bernie. They invited to come back here to keep this conversation going. And he's kept his word. Yes. We've continued to work with this community to help tell their stories at climateuprising.org, working with campfire survivors on both sides of the aisle to make a bipartisan call for climate action. With less than 12 years to solve this crisis, we must work together to build a movement. And elect leaders like Bernie at every level will pass bold climate action in line with the science. Together we can make sure that the next chapter of our collective story is not the last. Thank you. One of the uh, inspiring developments that's taken place in the last couple of years has been the increased involvement of young people in political struggle. Um, Stephen Park is a leader of Chico's Sunrise Movement and member of Chico 350. Stephen Park. My name is Stephen Markware and I am an organizer with Sunrise Chico. I'm here today because I know that climate change is an existential threat that can no longer be denied nor ignored. The science is clear. And here in Butte County, after the campfire, which burned multiple of our town to the ground due to conditions that were made worse by climate change, we've already dealt with this existential threat. Right. Climate change threatens our food, 
our water, and our air. We have the ability to stave off the worst effects of climate change if we demand bold solutions from our politicians, our institutions, and ourselves. Climate change affects everybody, and we will need everybody to organize if we're gonna tackle it. We have the resources, we have the technology, and we have the ability to enact a Green New Deal, to transform our economy, to be one that is truly sustainable, one that is environmentally friendly, economically stimulating, and socially equitable. What we lack, what we lack is a political will to make these changes. And that political will can only be fostered if by a grassroots movement of millions of people demanding bold solutions that we need. I'm grateful, I'm very grateful that Senator Bernie Sanders has been calling for that movement and for those bold solutions because he knows that ordinary people organizing for climate solutions is absolutely vital for us to achieve climate justice. Now is the time to organize. If you've never been political, now is the time to engage. If you've never seen yourself as a leader, now is the time to step up. And if you've never fought for justice, now is the time to fight. We are, building, we are building a movement like never before, and with leaders like Senator Bernie Sanders, we will create the livable future that we all deserve. Thank you. Well, let me thank Audrey, Mark, and Chelsea, and Javon, and Stephen uh, for their remarks. And let me thank all of you for coming out. You know, I do a lot of political rallies, but I honestly don't see this as a political rally. Uh, and I appreciate the support that we have here, but this is, to me, much less a political event than an understanding that in our country and the world we have an unprecedented crisis, and that as a nation, as a world, we have got to come together. When we talk about our responsibilities uh, as human beings, and as parents, many of us are parents, and Jane and I have seven beautiful grandchildren. There is nothing that I can think of that is more important than leaving this planet healthy and habitable for them and for the generations to come after them. That is a moral responsibility. And what we have got to be very clear about despite what some politicians may tell us, is that the debate over climate change is over. The scientific community has spoken in a virtually unanimous voice. Climate change is real. Climate change is caused by human activity. Climate change is already causing devastating problems in California, in Vermont, all over this country and all over this world. And what is very frightening is the scientists recently told us that they were wrong in terms of their estimates regarding the severity of the crisis. They underestimated the crisis. And what they are now telling us is that we have fewer than 12 years to act boldly in transforming our energy system away from fossil fuel into energy efficiency and sustainable energy, or else they tell us there will be irreparable damage done to our planet. And our job is to make sure that we do everything we can in every way possible to prevent that from happening. Let us be clear that if we do not act together, by that I mean not only in California, not only in America, but all over the world, we will see more devastating disasters like the terrible wildfires we have seen here in Paradise. We will see more droughts. We will see more famine. 
We will see more rising sea levels. We will see more floods, more ocean acidification, more extreme weather disturbances, more disease, more death, and more human suffering. Now, people are telling me that Bernie, the plan you just released to combat climate change is expensive. And you know what? They are right. It is expensive. But the cost of doing nothing is far more expensive. <laughs> the economists have told us that the cost of inaction, inaction on climate change will cost some $69 trillion throughout the globe. The scientists have told us that the cost of inaction on climate change will put the entire planet and life as we know it on Earth in serious jeopardy. Because what we have been told is that if we do nothing, the effects of climate change will lead to over 250,000 deaths every single year year across the globe from factors including malnutrition, heat stress, malaria, and other diseases, and that is a very conservative number. If we do nothing, what we have been told is that the effects of climate change will throw over 100 million people throughout the world into extreme poverty. People will not have land to till. They will not have water to drink. Their abysmally low standard of living will become even lower. If we do nothing, the World Bank has told us that the effects of climate change could result in the mass migration and displacement of more than 140 million people in Latin America, South Asia, and Sub-Saharan Africa by 2015. In other words, if people can't stay alive in the areas where they are living right now, they're going to get up, they're going to migrate, and that causes massive national security issues. In fact, in 2018 alone, some 840,000 people in Guatemala experienced extreme food shortages because of drought-related crop failures, forcing families to choose between starvation and migration. According to a recent report, half a billion people throughout the world already live in places that are turning into deserts, where the soil is being lost up to 100 times faster than it is forming. If we do nothing, the CIA and other intelligence agencies have warned us that the effect of heat waves, droughts, and floods substantially increase the risk of war, social unrest, and cross-border tension in countries like Egypt, Ethiopia, Jordan, and Iraq. Donald Trump says that climate change is a hoax. Donald Trump is dangerously, dangerously wrong. This June and July, and the point that I want to make, I don't want to get into Donald Trump, I talk enough about Trump. <laughs> but on this issue, his ignorance is going to impact not just our country, but the entire planet. And we have got to stand up to that ignorance. This June and July, as you know, were the warmest months in recorded history. In fact, the last five years were the warmest on record. The so-called hoax of climate change threatens to destroy our food and water supply, flood our cities and towns, and displace millions of people from their homes. And let me tell you just a bit about rising sea levels. What the scientists have told us is that if we do nothing, coastal cities like Miami could be significantly underwater by the year 2045. Let me say a word about heat waves. The extreme heat wave in July caused 400 people to die in the Netherlands alone. 
It caused more than 18,000 hospitalizations in Japan, and 169 million people in the United States were put on an extreme heat alert. The Centers for Disease Control has found that extreme heat events, quote, are the most prominent cause of weather-related human mortality in the United States, responsible for more deaths annually than hurricanes, lightning, tornadoes, floods, and earthquakes combined. In other words, when it becomes extremely hot, people who are vulnerable, often the elderly, will die. And let me tell you a little bit about extreme weather disturbances. In May, the Washington Post reported, quote, half of America looked like Tornado Alley, end quote. Oklahoma, Missouri, and Iowa experienced record-breaking rainfalls and severe floods. The top 10 natural disasters in the United States since 2000, including Hurricanes Katrina, Harvey, Maria, and Sandy, caused over $660 billion in damage and over 5,500 deaths. Right here in California, your beautiful state, one of the worst droughts in history was intensified by climate change. Researchers are telling us that if we do not get our act together, California's entire agricultural economy, an economy that feeds much of this country, could be in serious danger. 15 of the 20 largest fires in California history have occurred since 2000. And scientists tell us that these fires are getting bigger and bigger and harder to deal with because of climate change. So I just want to thank, I don't know if we have firefighters in the room. And I want to thank, I want to personally thank the enormous courage of the firefighting community for putting their lives on the line to defend us all. And we're gonna give them the support that they need. And obviously, when I talk about disasters, um, the community here, all of you, uh, have gone through something that I hope not many people have got to go through. Less than a year ago, the campfire swept through this community and destroyed some 14,000 homes and killed at least 85 people and will cost some $16 billion in damage. That is $16 billion in one small community of some 26,000 people for one, one, one disaster. Multiply that cost by towns all over the world that are threatened by fire, and you understand, begin to understand what the magnitude of this disaster is about. My friends, the pain, <clears throat> suffering, and tragedy you experienced here cannot and will not be forgotten. Let Paradise, California be the wake-up call for our entire nation. <laughs> a nation, we have a fundamental choice. We can listen to the know-nothing people like Trump and the other climate deniers, people who will get substantial money, amounts of money in campaign contributions from the fossil fuel industry. Or we can listen to the scientists who tell us clearly and unequivocally that we must act boldly and aggressively to prevent a climate catastrophe. I choose to listen to the scientists. And today, today we are telling the fossil fuel industry as loudly and clearly as we can that their short-term profits are not more important than the future of this planet. The 
threat of climate change is a very clear example of where American leadership can and must make a profound difference. Europe cannot do it alone. Asia cannot do it alone. The United States cannot do it alone. Latin America and Africa cannot do it alone. This is a crisis that calls out for strong international cooperation, and that is exactly the kind of leadership that I will provide as President of the United States. secret that we must transition away from fossil fuel, period, end of the story. There ain't no middle ground here. There is no middle ground. And that means, among many other things, that we will end all of the ways that taxpayers currently subsidize and support the fossil fuel industry. The United States today, direct and indirect subsidies for coal, oil, and gas reached $649 billion in 2015. Got that? Those are the kinds of subsidies that the fossil fuel industry received, and those are the kinds of subsidies and tax breaks that I intend to end as President of the United States. We are also going to support efforts to divest pension funds and universities from fossil fuel holders. And I want to congratulate many young people on campuses all over this country who are in the process of doing that. Instead of having our money at international financial agencies support fossil fuels, we're going to create a green climate fund to help the developing world lower their carbon pollution because this is an international crisis. We will immediately end all new and existing fossil fuel extraction on federal public lands. We will ban fracking and mountaintop removal. Instead of bragging about being the world's largest oil producer, we are going to be leading the world in sustainable energy. And let me tell you something else. This, again, is, is kind of radical, but I think we have got to think of these things. We're in, and I mean that, I mean that very seriously, that in this moment of global crisis, we have got to rethink the way we have looked at the world. That's where we're at. We are finally going to end the fossil fuels, fossil fuel industry's legal immunity. Now, what does that mean? What does it mean? This is an important issue. Look, everybody makes mistakes. Everybody in this room has made a mistake. Every doctor has made a mistake. Every engineer, every poli even politicians occasionally <laughs> make mistakes. But what we have got to look at is if somebody produces a product and it turns out to be a harmful product, and they say, oh my God, we didn't know that. That is one thing, and that happens all of the time. But when somebody produces a product which they knowingly understand to be harmful, that is a different situation. Today, just 100 companies have been the source of more than 70% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions in the last three decades, 100 companies. They have been permitted to walk away from their toxic spills their abandoned wells, and other environmental disasters. Documents have emerged, as many of you know, in court cases, 
that show that the top fossil fuel executives have known for decades that their products were destroying the planet and they buried those documents in order to continue making as much money as possible. So there is a difference between ignorance, just not knowing, and suppressing the truth. Make no mistake about it. What the executives of Exxon Mobil and other fossil fuel executives are doing is exactly what the tobacco industry did when it lied about the health risks associated with smoking. Conduct that led to federal racketeering convictions. When I am president, I will appoint an attorney general who will finally hold the executives at the fossil fuel industry accountable for their criminal behavior. Further, we will eliminate all of the fossil fuel industry's tax breaks, of which there are many. Last year, if you can believe it, as a result of Trump's tax giveaway to the rich, not only did 24 fossil fuel companies throughout the country pay nothing in federal income taxes, they actually received a $2 billion tax refund from the IRS after making $38 billion in profits. Take a step back, take a step back and think about it. Here you have an industry which every day is helping to destroy our planet. You got many of them not only paying nothing in federal income tax, they are receiving a $2 billion tax refund from the IRS. So we say to the fossil fuel industry, we will end those tax giveaways and substantially raise taxes on the companies that are creating the climate crisis. And furthermore, we will use that revenue to make massive investments in renewable energy, energy efficiency, and sustainable energy. And by the way, when we do that, we are not just going to meet the recommendations of climate scientists by moving to 100% renewable energy for electricity and transportation by 2030 and decarbonizing our economy by 2050. We are also going to create some 20 million new good paying jobs. These jobs will be good paying union jobs, building, building the new electric cars and high speed rail systems that we need, weatherizing, retrofitting millions and millions of homes and buildings from one end of this country to the other, rebuilding our nation's infrastructure and generating an unprecedented level of sustainable energy. Under this plan, we will be making an historic $16.3 trillion investment in sustainable energy. Like wind and solar, we will substantially increase manufacturing of sustainable energy products and infrastructure, put a whole lot of money into research and development. <laughs> Under this plan, we will use our existing energy producing agencies to expand wind, solar, energy storage, and geothermal power plants and fully eliminate fossil fuel energy sources. <laughs> Despite what the fossil fuel industry may want you to believe, the reality is that solar and wind are already cheaper than coal. We 
will also invest in efficiency, which is the low-hanging fruit that is out there, so that we get the most out of the energy that we are generating. That means building a resilient, secure, and energy-efficient smart grid. It means requiring that new construction and existing commercial buildings meet tough energy efficiency and electrification standards. And it means aggressively weatherizing homes and businesses in a way that will let us reduce residential energy consumption by 30%. Further, no plan to transform our energy system would be complete without addressing our transportation system, which is responsible for about a third of our carbon emissions. Under this plan, we are going to fully electrify and decarbonize America's transportation system. We are going to expand successful zero emissions vehicle programs and make sure these programs don't just benefit the very wealthy. Through vehicle trade-in programs, we're going to make sure electric vehicles are available to all people, not just people who have a lot of money. We will also make major new investments in affordable and carbon-free public transit systems, high-speed rail, and the research and development that will make energy storage equipment like batteries more efficient and more affordable. There is huge potential out there. The Green New Deal is not going to be a way for billionaires and corporations to create even more inequality, but it will be a way for us to build an economy that works for all of us, not just the few. And importantly, and this is an important point, and I want all of you to know what I hope most of you already know, that probably there is no member of the Senate or even the House who has a stronger pro-worker, pro-union voting record and life activity than Bernie Sanders does. So when we talk about a transition, we understand that the coal miners are not our enemies. They're trying to put food on the table for their kids. We understand the guys and the women who work on oil rigs are not our enemies, people who work in the fossil fuel industry. So when we talk about a program that transform our, transforms our energy system away from fossil fuel, we are talking about the need for a just transition for workers in the fossil fuel industry. That is why our plan invests $1.3 trillion, that's a lot of money, to ensure that fossil fuel workers receive a living wage, retraining, health care, a good job, and a secure pension. We are not going to forget about the men and women who work in the fossil fuel industry. Our plan will create millions of jobs rebuilding our roads, bridges, and water systems, constructing community centers, restoring our wetlands, and substantially expanding our capacity to fight forest fires and respond to climate emergencies. Yeah. We know that small towns and fire departments alone cannot address these crises. We will have their backs. My friends, uh, I would not be telling you the truth and you would not believe me if I said uh, that this process of transforming our energy system is going to be easy. It is not. On top of all of the work we have got to do to fight climate change, we also face an enormously powerful political opposition that will do everything that it can to protect their profits and their greed. And you know something, I gotta say, you know, and I say this from the bottom of my heart, I simply do not understand 
are people in the fossil fuel industry. These are people, these are men and women who have children, they have grandchildren. They are not oblivious to what is happening. I do not understand why they continue to believe that their short-term profits are more important than the well-being of their kids and their grandchildren, let alone everybody else's. And I say to the fossil fuel industry, I understand that this is difficult. And for many of you who came into the industry, you didn't cause this problem. I mean, you didn't wake up. This is not, you know, this is what you inherited. But the time is now to understand the damage that you are doing. Stop destroying the planet. As we look out at the destruction here in paradise and in the pain, that this community and other communities around the country have experienced as a result of climate change, we know that we cannot allow the greed of fossil fuel billionaires to destroy our planet and our children's future for one second longer. So to the fossil fuel industry, we want to work with you. We want to make this transition as quick and as painless as we possibly can. But this transition is coming, whether you like it or not. <laughs> let us also, let us also be very clear in saying that failure is not an option. Unless we take the action necessary to save our planet and reverse climate change, our children, grandchildren and great-grandchildren are going to look back in this period in history. And what I worry very much for all of us, and again, I have seven grandchildren, I don't want 20 years from now, 30 years from now, 40 years from now, for any person in this room to have to confront some child when that child says, Grandpa, Grandma, you knew what the scientists were saying. Why didn't you do something back then before it came to this? We know what is going on. So, brothers and sisters, we are in this fight in California, Vermont, and all over this country, and all over the world. And once again, I'm not here to tell you that this stuff is going to be easy. It is not going to be easy. We're taking on a whole lot of very powerful special interests. But nothing less than the future of our country and the well-being of this planet is at stake. And with the stakes that high, we cannot afford to fail, and we will not fail. Thank you all very much.